morning, Christ Church. Welcome to worship on this lovely day. It's such a wonderful gift that we have to be able to gather together in a building that's warm and it's safe and there we're not worried about leaks or anything like that, even though when we look outside it's cold and it's frigid and there's snow piled up everywhere. We can come in here and do it in the comfort of air conditioning and heating and everything like that. And so thanks for coming. I know it's always a journey to come out. Uh, especially after snow days, especially after a a weird week that it's been, but I'm glad to have you guys here, and I'm glad to see you, and glad to worship with you, and glad to do it together as a community. So, uh, as we've done, we'll let's open up our service um, by, with an expression of worship that is uh, through the packing of bags for our kids in the elementaries who need food. Um, We do this because we believe that worship is not something that we watch something, but it's something that we participate in. It's it's the going out and doing an expression of Jesus' love, just as it is the praise and the prayers and study. And so I invite you during this next song to pack some bags. Otherwise, if you would like to stay seated, take some time to pray for those families and those kids, uh, and we will take this time to worship God. Let's worship.
Amen. I invite you um, to stand if you feel led. Um, your lyrics are on the sheet, but we've been doing the same five songs for about the last five weeks in an attempt to hopefully give you a little bit more confidence to sing out without using the lyric sheet. So I encourage you, if you think you've got it, try and do it without it. Um, otherwise, it's there for you. That's why we have it. So, um, But as always, I invite you to stand and worship with us. If you don't have a lyric sheet, they are on the chairs around you. Thank you. 
church as we call upon the Lord to open our eyes as we seek to see his holiness as we seek uh, to affirm the foundation that he gives us so also it is good for us to acknowledge the things that block us from seeing his holiness to acknowledge the things that uh, we wish to hide away and we wish to uh, keep to ourselves because they don't match the holiness of God because they don't match the perfection of his presence and so Christ church I invite you let us pray a prayer of confession Dear Lord, Lord, you are the one who is the refuge to whom we can call on when we are in times of need. You're the one who is a place of safety for those who are in danger. You are the one who lifts up for those who are weak. You're the one who listens when we cry out. And Lord, because of who you are, who we've known you to be, who you, we, you've revealed yourself to be for us, Lord. We come to you. We come to you in worship. And Lord, as we do so, we acknowledge the things um, that we would rather leave in the dark, but the things that we would rather leave unsaid, the, the realities, the sin, the shame, the guilt that we have, that is so hard to talk about, but yet is so necessary in order, Lord, to be in community. Father, as we see, as we hear about, as we know, and as we seek to experience and, and the relationship and love that you have for us, Lord, we acknowledge that there are times when we would rather go on our own. We confess that there are times in which we would rather be the center of our lives, we would rather have our own glory be our, the motivation. We acknowledge the times in which we will shy away from you, from your gospel, from your word, because it's more convenient, because it requires less sacrifice, it is more comfortable, and it's not requires to suffer to go and, and follow the ways of the world instead of following your own words. And Lord, we ask for your help. When we see a neighbor in need, when we see a family member who we are called to love and yet we may not always want to, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be working, that you would be removing the obstacles in the way, whether it be uh, the pressures of society, whether it be uh, the uncertainty of, of budgets, whether it be um, a loss of time and a loss of comfort and a loss of some of the, the pleasures that we enjoy in this world. Move our hearts. Guide our hands and our feet. Lord, may we be a community. May we be a family. May we be a church that declares your glory, that shows um, yeah, why we should worship you and why we do, how you have changed our lives. Father, we ask all of this so that, so that we may become community, we may become a church, we may be the body of Christ uh, and point to the hope that we have, the hope for eternal life, the hope of life in your kingdom forever. Father, we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Christ Church, hear these words from Psalm 103, starting in verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As we come before the Lord, as we worship him, as we remind ourselves of why we worship him through these songs, I invite you to use this next song both as a prayer and as an opportunity for reflection. Um, that as we read the Bible, as we read the words, as we read the things that he's given us and we seek to study them and to grow from them and to be transformed in our own lives, 
that we would be listening to God and, and listening to what he's saying and not to what we want to hear. So please join with us in this next song. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness. Dear Lord, Lord, as we open up your scriptures, as we open up these words that you've given us to us so many years ago, and we seek to study them, and we seek to apply them, Lord, we ask that you would be guiding us, you would send us your Holy Spirit. Lord, that as I preach, as I ask questions, as I help seek to help us dive in, Lord, may you use my words, may you use um, this time together, may you use our interactions as a community of faith to grow to be encouraged, to have a, de uh, a deepening of our desire to know you, a deepening of our faith, our deepening of our understanding of why we need you, of why we needed you to die on the cross and to be raised again. Father, I pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We've been in Luke for a few weeks now. And so we're going to be back in Luke as we continue on in our series, to the surprise of no one, I'm sure. So let's continue on. We're in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, and I invite you to read along with me. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico, and none of the rest dared join them. 
but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So, as we dig into this, I want to actually get us off track for a moment and then bring us back on track. So, in this very first verse, talking about how the disciples are doing many signs and wonders regularly done among the people. And this is always a sticking point, or at least this is in my conversations of we read about these signs and these wonders. We read about these miracles in the Bible. Where are they now? Why don't we regularly see the sick people being healed all the time? Why do, does sickness still happen in our church? Why, when we pray for people, why do they still die? And I'm going to be real blunt here. I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. But here's a couple of things that I think that we should consider when we're asking these questions. One, looking at when these happened, they pointed to something. They pointed to a sign. We, we've talked about this a couple times, but every time that signs and wonders are done, when they started with Jesus, even back in throughout the Old Testament, here throughout the apostles, the purpose of them being done was so that people would see and know the message that Jesus was preaching. They would come and they would want to hear the message that the apostles were preaching, the message of good news, the message of forgiveness. But then there's another part of this, and we read about this last week, and we covered it a little bit, that in a place where, where there is no healing, or there is no sickness, sorry, where there is no sickness, where there is no death, where there is no injury, where there is no deformity, we're in a place of perfection. We're in a place where the effects of sin are not being felt. And there's only one place where that happens. It's in the kingdom of God. And the thing is, the hard part about the kingdom of God is that where, where there is perfection, that means that there also is no sin. In Christ's church, as we explored last week, we still live in the in-between. We live after sin came into the world, and Jesus came and established the kingdom of God, but before Jesus came again. And so sin is still present here. We know this. We're told by John, back, although if you remember that study, all the way back in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, that he who says he is without sin is a liar. We know we all sin. And we all desire for the effects of sin not to be felt. But in order for the desires of sin not to be felt, there can't also be sin. And so you have a choice. Do we exist or is there perfection? Because wherever we are, if we bring sin with us, there also cannot also be perfection. For what good, what need would we have for heaven? What need would we have for Jesus if we didn't also feel the effects of our sin? Not to mention that it's not possible. And so in considering, where are the signs and wonders? Well, number one, we have seen them. I've heard them from your testimonies. I've heard them through prayers of healing for children. I've heard them in prayers uh, uh, of finding ourselves in really difficult circumstances and things happening that seem, could be called coincidental but seem far too convenient to be coincidental. There are so many testimonies that have happened here in the history of Christ Church that I would call miracles, that I would call signs, that I would call wonders. So I've seen them happen. Perhaps they're not as dramatic as we might think of or we might read or perhaps they're uh, not as frequent as we would wish them to be but also Christ church that is why that is why we long for heaven because this is not perfect this will never be perfection until Jesus comes again and until sin is no more until that so until that time we continue to lament we continue to grieve we continue to call upon and hope for Jesus in a time in which sin would be no more and as we grapple with the why not, we look forward to the when it will be. And so as we read about this, as we read about the apostles and do them doing signs and wonders, first and foremost, we see that this is an affirmation of the authority that they have through Jesus. That just as Jesus did signs and wonders, so also they have the authority of Jesus, which is why we are still reading about what they did 2,000 years later. 
And so the apostles are doing these signs and wonders. And by the way, when they're doing them and they're all together in the temple in Solomon's portico and they're studying and they're healing and they're doing all the things, what's the next thing you read? No one dared to join them. Interesting. You would think if you're seeing people being healed, you would think if you're seeing lifelong cripples being walking again, that everyone would want to be a part of that. Everyone would flock to that. That is, that is what I feel myself. If we were to see that, if only we were to see signs like that, everyone would be, want to be a part of that. And yet we're reading, no one dared join them. Why? Again, the text doesn't say why nobody dared join them, but let's see what just happened. One, they, they were arrested by the people who were in authority, by the government, and told never to preach again, and threatened. Two, the people that were with them, when they sinned, when they lied, fell down dead. So there's an implicit threat of being close to these people is incredibly dangerous. One, you might face persecution. Two, you might die. Now, by the way, you won't die if you're just honest and don't lie, but that's a pretty tall, tall task in and of itself as well. So nobody dared to join them, but yet the people still held them in high esteem, recognizing they're doing good things. We like what they're doing. We, the message that they're preaching is worth hearing. We hold them in high esteem, but we don't dare join them. And yet, and yet even with that sort of barrier, more and more believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, so that as Peter walked by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. And they gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were healed. They didn't dare join them in their studies and in their preaching and where they were at in Solomon's portico, uh, but they did recognize that there was something supernatural Something amazing, something wonderful going on by the effect of their presence. Now, last week when we talked about the, the marks of a spirit-filled church, we talked about a number of things. Uh, one, devoting ourselves to studying. Remember the other ones? Two, worshiping together. And three, the fellowship. There's one more thing that, they, that we, was in that passage that we see here going on that I want for us to explore. Ugh. And that was, the other mark of, the, of a spirit-filled community is that the people who are in need are being helped. Whether that be them, the people who are sick, the people who are in need of, of money, who are in debt, the people who were hungry, the people who were homeless, and the people who didn't have clothes, they were being helped by the community of God's people. And so, let's ask this question again. How, Christ Church, how do we help those who are in need? The Lynx program. We did it just at the beginning of the service, packing up food for our kids who need food over the weekend who would otherwise go hungry. Exactly, links, what else? Do visitations, exactly. Visitations bringing connection where there otherwise is isolation. Absolutely, what else? We do a mobile food distribution. Partnership with the St. Louis Food Bank. Absolutely. What else? Adopt a family at Christmas time. Restore St. Charles, going around and doing projects for people who might not otherwise be able to afford them and who need them. Ah, and by the way, this is, let me use this as an announcement. We do an Oasis Food Bank Challenge just about every year. I don't think we did it last year, but this year we're doing it again starting February 27th. For, the, for, for, for a month from there, we'll be collecting food items to give to the Oasis Food Bank. So, one... The, food, the newsletter has the items that are going to be collected. And two, this is a way that we help the needy. Good. 
Any other thoughts? Any other ideas? Meals for those of us who get sick, for those of us who are going, having a baby or other things like that. Meal trains, absolutely. Yeah, donations, our support and our partnerships with Fish and St. Joachim and Anne's. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty extensive list already, and there's still many things more to be said. And so, Christ Church, once again, once again, uh, let me exhort you, let me encourage you, let me applaud you that you do the things that a church is supposed to do. The Holy Spirit is clearly at work here in Christ Church through the way in which we devote ourselves to study. We have worship and Bible studies almost every single day of the week and prayer groups getting together. We have fellowship. This is a church that loves to fellowship, to be with each other. We, uh, yeah, and worship as well. We come to worship here on Sundays. We had worship last night. The Wayfarers and Ministry had worship last night. We do uh, worship not just in the formal settings of the temples, but also in the informal settings when we get together. And then we also, we help the needy. Another mark of, of Jesus' love for us, of the apostles, of what the Spirit-filled church does is you go and you see those who are in need and you help them. And so my encouragement, right, with that is continue to do this, to be involved to be a part of this because this is what creates community. This is what creates relationships and family. And through this, through our engagement in this and with the community, this is how we preach Jesus to the people around us. By the preaching of the gospel, the teaching of the gospel, and also through the actions and the doing of the gospel. So just as we see these, as we hear about the disciples and the apostles, and they're doing these signs and wonders, and they're taking care of the sick and the needy, and though people are afraid to join them, they still hold them in high esteem because they recognize the things that they're doing are worth doing, are good things. We, we want them to be doing those things. Christ Church, so also, so also should we be regarded by our communities, that when they think of Christ Church, when they hear of us, when they see us around, they highly regard us, even if they don't want to join us, at least they would hold us in high esteem because we serve and we love against which there is no law or rule. So, things are lovely. The apostles are doing these signs and wonders. Everybody's holding them in high esteem. People are believing in Christ Jesus. And though people don't want to necessarily join them, the community of God is spreading. So what happens next? Verse 17, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. And during the night, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Things were going great, and now all of a sudden, once again, this has happened once before, but once again, they're facing opposition. The people in power don't like what's going on. Although they are held in high esteem, those who are in authority, those who had the authority, those who were charged with overseeing the entire nation's relationship with God don't like what the apostles are doing, and so they put them in jail. One of the realities, one of the things that we've explored is that in this world we still suffer or we still experience the effects of sin. Because this world is still, though Jesus has come, though the kingdom has started, this world is still under the rule of sin. If you're Outside of the kingdom is the kingdom of sin. And the thing is, is that if this is, if this is true, if what we are saying is true, if sin really does have that stranglehold on this world, then who, whatever power structures there are, whatever authority structures there may be, are similarly in some way empowered by sin. And so when the message of Jesus comes, when the life that Jesus declares and brings and the love that he declares comes so these uh, structures will be threatened 
that which is enabled by sin and oppression will be threatened and it will not be passive in the face of it. There will be opposition, just as the apostles face opposition here. Though everyone holds them in high esteem and they recognize that they're doing good things, there will be opposition because it will threaten the comfort, it will threaten the way of life, it will threaten the status quo. It will violently change things, though not through violence, but through cataclysmic way differences in the ways that we relate to each other. And there will be pushback. There will be opposition In fact, just this last week in Brookings, Oregon, I don't know if any of you have read this story, in Brookings, Oregon, the town council passed an ordinance so that St. Timothy's Episcopal Church could no longer give out free meals to the homeless every single day of the week. They limited them to two days a week because loving those who are sick, loving those who are homeless, loving those who are not in a good place is messy. And it brought with them, the surrounding neighbors complained that they had homeless people littering and doing drugs and sleeping in their backyards. And so in response, the city told the the church, you may no longer feed the homeless. It's a pretty clear example of the comfort that that is brought through the structures, through the status quo, through the the empowerment of of sin, when challenged, when disrupted, will push back. Christ Church, uh, in your history, I've heard a few stories like this, but also this is is, uh, an encouragement going forward, that as we seek to do Christ's work, there will be opposition. And it won't always look like persecution, violent persecution. It won't always look like a threat to our safety. But it may come in, in ways and in forms that we stand that don't make a lot of sense because sin doesn't make a lot of sense. And so these disciples, right, they were arrested, they were put in prison, but God freed them from prison. It was a supernatural act, a supernatural thing. And he said, go and preach, go and preach in the temple. And so they did, knowing, (laughs) knowing that they were already been arrested for doing this. They've already gotten in trouble for doing this once, and so they're back at it again. And now what happens? Well, now though, when the high priest came, and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, and so they returned and reported, we have found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what would this come to. And someone came and said to them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And then the captain and the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. This is a really weird situation because... They got out of prison. The first thought, at least this would have been my first thought, if I was the temple guard, they paid somebody. This is an inside job. Somebody let them out. And yet there they are, once again, not fleeing, not running away, but doing the very same thing that they got arrested for previously. And so they go to arrest them again. But because they were held in high esteem, they didn't dare to do it by force. There are so many things here that don't make sense. (laughs) So many things about why are you arresting these people if they're healing the sick, if they're doing good words, if they've gotten out of jail previously, supernaturally, in a way that you can't explain, and yet you are still going to arrest them and bring them back. Somebody is not thinking. In fact, there's a lot of people who aren't thinking straight here, not stopping to be curious and wondering what exactly is going on. So they bring them back, and when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. 
The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Sounds very familiar to situations that have happened time and time again in the presence of the council of the religious leaders of that time. But a Pharisee of the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. And so in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them. <laughs> and they, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. All right, let's review a little bit of what's going on here. So they come before the high priest, and he says, we told you not to say this. There's going to be consequences. And Peter Peter, remember Peter, back in the, in the Gospel of Luke, Peter, the same man whom Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, because he was going to use force, he was going to use the weapons of the world, the weapons of sin to overcome sin, when Jesus was going to do the thing that would save us all from sin, the, the man who denied Jesus three different times for fear of dying at the hands of the religious authorities. That very same Peter is now standing up and answering to this very same council that killed Jesus, to this very same council that has taken them from, taken them from the temple and arrested them, not once, but twice, telling them that we must obey God rather than men. Something fundamental has changed here in Peter. And when the people had heard this, when the council heard this, when the religious authorities heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them again. Now, this is far, completely out of the people's control, right? The apostles have no, have no control over their own fate at this point in time. They've been arrested. They're under the, the guard of the captains again. They were let out of prison once, but here they are. Now, now the council is gathered together saying, we want to kill them. And just as God has done time and time again throughout this story, he steps in. Through a way that we wouldn't expect, through a way that we otherwise wouldn't be able to anticipate or plan out for um, or even to rely on, in the voice of Gamaliel. Now, it's easy to read this thing and to think of think this person, think this, this Pharisee as um, sympathetic perhaps. Perhaps he was sympathetic to them, but a little bit about Gamaliel. He was also the teacher of Saul, <laughs> a guy who we're about to see in a little bit who persecuted and rounded up and killed Christians. He was a Pharisee who were the people who uh, opposed Jesus the most throughout the Gospel of Luke. This is not somebody who is looking at the, the cause of the apostles and is sympathetic to them. No, no, no. He is much more sympathetic to the authority structure that is in Israel at that time. And yet, and yet God uses him. God uses him so that the apostles, not only are they spared death, but they are continually able and released again. Not even kept in prison anymore, but released and allowed to continue preaching their gospel. So throughout this story, first you've got the apostles unable to do signs and wonders. Something they wouldn't do by themselves. By the way, that's always the key piece, is when they do, when they do a miracle, it's not Peter who's doing it, it's not Paul who's doing it. It's not Matthew or James or John or any of the other apostles doing it. It's God who does it, the Spirit who does it. We don't do miracles. We don't do signs and wonders. God does signs and wonders. 
God is the one who enables, who overcomes the obstacles, who overcomes the things in front of us to do the miraculous. And when they were arrested, when they were put in prison, God was the one who freed them, who brought them out of the prison and said, go and teach in the temple. And so they did. Now, once again, they're arrested and they are facing death. In fact, the people want to kill them. There seemingly is nothing between, (laughs) nothing preventing these apostles from being killed because these people have shown as they killed Jesus, if they want it to be done, they will make it happen. And yet, once again, once again, God enables them to go and to preach the gospel by the voice of Gamaliel, who is not somebody that you would have expected otherwise, raising up and talking and convincing them not to oppose these apostles. Now, by the way, it's not that they didn't suffer. Look at this at the end. As God, over helps, as God removes these obstacles from before the disciples, from before the apostles and their preaching of God, they still, they still go through an incredible amount of hardship. They release them, but they beat them. And, and most, most scholars, most teaching would say that when they're beating them, they're talking about the infamous um, 40 minus one lashes, meaning that they, using a, a whip, a cat of nine tails whip, they would, beat, they would whip them 39 times because the, the, the thought, the legend was that if you beat, whipped a man 40 times, he would die. But if you only did it 39 times, he would be one lash away from death. So this isn't simply a stern talking to. No, they put them, these disciples, these apostles on the brink of death. Though they didn't kill them, they still put them to the brink of death. They still suffered immensely for doing what God told them to do. Now, Christ Church, we don't face death for preaching the gospel. Thankfully, here in America, we do not face the threat of physical harm for preaching the gospel. In most cases, or at least not yet by the government. Our brothers and sisters around the world do. And so we pray for them. Lord, we pray for them now. We pray for our brothers and sisters in China. We pray for them in Iran and Iraq and the Middle East and throughout Russia and many of the other countries hostile to your gospel. Lord, may you overcome and take away their obstacles just as you did for the apostles. And yet, Christ Church, as we as we've highlighted time and time again, the structures and the authority of structures of sin will oppose the message of the gospel because, because it will radically change who has power, who has authority, how we relate to each other, and the comfort of those in power. And so, and so there will be suffering, there will be hardship, it will be hard to go and to preach and teach the gospel and to live a life that the Spirit calls us to and he enables us to. Now, what ways would we suffer? What, what things do we have, uh, if, if not physical persecution, if not uh, the threat of death necessarily, what things might we suffer? Take a moment. Actually, I, I would like, let's, let's do this. Take a moment, take a minute, turn to your neighbors, think about what things would you suffer, what things might you suffer if we went and we preached and teach, taught the gospel in the way that we're called to do. We'll start. You guys can be my group.
I'm interested. What are some of the things that you guys have talked about? What are some of the things that you suffer by, by doing what we're called to do? Yeah, the discomfort. Because what's the things that you're not supposed to talk about in polite society? Politics, religion, you could maybe even add money in there. But religion, right, to talk about it, you're, it's, just, it's uncomfortable. As we were talking about, you risk relationships potentially. Because you're talking about, the thing, like you're talking about something that's, that's divisive, that we see as divisive, that we see as should be a private thing. And now you're, you're making it public and you're making it a part of relationships and you risk, you risk comfort and relationship with that. Absolutely. What else? You risk reputation. You risk being judged, right? Absolutely. Yeah, either by those who consider Christianity to be a, a fairy tale and something that only stupid people believe in or judgment that you're going to be one of those, you know, pushy, proselytizing Christians who, who makes everyone around them uncomfortable. Yeah, and I'm sure there's other ways, too, that you can be judged for, for talking about Jesus. What else? What other ways can you suffer? You might, you might, uh, you might have opportunities closed off to you. Absolutely, and in that... Um, because of your affiliation, because of being that Jesus person, eh, you don't either, either getting invited into something or not being able to participate in different things. Um, and I'm going to add something onto that too, is that doing the work of Jesus, right, choosing to come and go to the food distribution might mean giving up, giving up uh, the chance to pursue a promotion at work. Coming to worship, coming to, to, to Bible studies in the mornings or after work might mean giving up some of the overtime hours that otherwise you could put in and be that exemplary employee that your boss might look into because, ah, because you're doing the things that God's called you to. There's also the comfort, the, the, the very real thing that we, we pursue as, Christi- as, as Americans of convenience and comfort to go with that too, right? To come to church is inconvenient. It's so much easier to sit in bed and to sleep in or to s- not participate. It's so much easier on a Wednesday night after a long, or a Tuesday evening after a long day at work, after you're coming home and you had to make supper for your family and it, it, to, to just call it a night and to, to be lazy, to turn on Netflix rather than get everyone ready, come to church to come to a prayer meeting. It's so much easier not to do that. Yeah, right. There's the sacrifice, right? If, if, we, if we use our money in a way that God calls us to, to glorify the people, to meet the needs of the people around us, then there's a loss of comfort there too. Perhaps we're not able to afford many of the comforts that we would like to enjoy, <laughs> right? And those, can be, those are as, as wide and as varied as the commercials you see on TV, literally. So even though we might not suffer, we might not face the threat of physical suffering, we might not ever be, have to, uh, ever, uh, be threatened with death because we preach Jesus. There is suffering in so many other ways that are... Uh, so small, and, and because they're not so blatant, they might be a whole lot harder to uh, come against. The loss of relationship and friendship, right? It, it's just one small conversation. If you're not having that, ah, you can keep the friendship. It's one small thing, right? The, the disciples, it was such a hard and fast cutoff. It was, it was don't preach at all or face death. Okay, that's a little bit easier of a decision because this is, this is a, a black and white thing, but when it's a little bit more gray, when the suffering is, is a little bit, uh, you don't have to do it, and you can still go to church, you can still preach Jesus, you can still read the Bible, you can still pray, you can still talk to people who want to talk to you about Jesus, but just not in this one case. And the loss of comfort, and the loss of convenience, and the loss of opportunities, because you're going and you're doing the things God called you to, rather than the things that the world has glorified as being necessary. Yeah, there's so many ways. And yet as we read on, after they've been beaten, after these apostles have been beaten within literally one inch of their life, then they left the presence of the council 
rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Amazing. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Dear Lord, may we, may we have the, the conviction, the faith, the fortitude, and, and the desire within us that when we suffer, we might rejoice. For Jesus said, just as I suffer, just as the world hates and opposes me, so also it will do with you. And you, you called us to count it as a joy. And here we see the apostles doing it in a situation that is far beyond my comprehension. Um, and so I pray, and I, this is my prayer for all of us, that Christ Jesus, as we read, as we dig in, as we look at what your church has done, as we look at how it started, and the obstacles that you removed from their path, Lord, is... Uh, as we seek to follow you faithfully. Oh, Lord, we pray that we would, um, we would have the boldness to preach your gospel, the opportunities to do that, and the endurance that when opposition comes, when suffering is there, that, Lord, we might, we might count it as a joy. Teach us what that means. Father, I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Christ Church, what is the gospel that we preach? Jesus came. The God himself came to earth. And he died for us on the cross so that we might be free from the power of sin. So that we might know eternal life here and forevermore. And he was raised to life. And we join in that life, we join in his holiness and we, his glory. And so we have this hope which we get to experience as a, in a foretaste here now. Even though sin is still present, we get to know a little bit of the kingdom of God. We get to get a glimpse in the, 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 the bit of the kingdom of God. And we, we wait while we wait for the fullness of it to come. And so as sin's shackles are broken as we get to understand and, and believe in and ask for forgiveness in Jesus' name, so also this is the message of love and freedom that we preach to the people around us. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after they had supped, he took the cup and he poured it out, saying, this is my blood, poured out as a New Testament on your behalf. As often as you do this, do so in remembrance of me. Christ Church, um, as you come to the table, one thing to note is that there is wine and grape juice in the, the tray. The inner lighter colored liquid is wine. Please take what is appropriate for you table is ready. Come and eat. Come and drink.
for you before we sing that doxology and give the benediction. One, the Oasis Food Pantry coming up. Check out that food list. It's going to be the same for all four weeks, which is a little bit different um, this time around. And, but I uh, invite you to, as you're grocery shopping, as you're going throughout your day, think about, grab those items, bring them in for the food drive during that month, starting on February 27th. Next one is, uh, we've t- talked about this a few times, we have a prayer retreat, April 22nd through 24th. And the last day to sign up for that is February 13th, which is one day from now, or one week from now, one day, one week from now. So one week to sign up for that. Um, so please sign up. Let us know get, uh, if you've been delaying, if you've been saying, I'll get to it later. Now's the time to get to it. Now's the time to sign up for it. So we'd love to have you there. And I think it'll be a wonderful time, a wonderful thing for all of us to do and be a part of. So Christ Church, as we, as we sing, as we pray, as we glorify God, uh, I'm Going to actually, I'll do the benediction now and use the doxology to send us out. Christ Church, may we be, uh, may we seek to obey God rather than men.
And may we rely on God to overcome the obstacles that uh, were put in our way through the doing and the teaching and the preaching of, of Jesus Christ and his good news. For it is not by our own power that um, people come to believe. It is not by our own power that signs and wonders and miracles are done. It is not by our own power that sins are forgiven. It is by God's. And we are only, we get the privilege and the honor to witness to it. And so my invitation, my call, my exhortation to you is to be the witnesses and to let God do the work. And as you go, may you go with the love of our Father. May you go with the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may you go with the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit. But even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's sing the doxology. Mm-hmm.